Hare Krishna, welcome to our Sunday Bhagavatam class. We'll begin, you can all chant. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So, uh, we'll begin today with First Canto, Chapter 3, Text 18. I hope the uh, internet is better. We move to a different location so that hopefully the signal will be stronger. So, um, 1, 3, 18 is Chatur Dasham Narasingham Vibradaityendram Urjitam Dadara Karajair Urav Irakang Katakrid Jata. So Chatur Dasham, which means the 14th avatar. Narasingha, the incarnation of Narasingha. Little Sanskrit detail. Uh, if you look at that verse in the Bhagavatam, it's the A first day is long, Narasingha, which means of Narasingha. The 14th was the incarnation of Narasingha. Bibra Daityendram Urjitam Dadara. So he held Urav on his lap, the powerful Lord of the Daityas. Lord of the demon, Daitya, Daitya Indra. Indra is now the name of the uh, demigod of uh, rain and thunder and so on. But Indra also means uh, the best or the leader. So here, Daitya Indra, the Daitya leader, Daityendra. So Bhivra, Daityendra, holding on his lap, the Daityendra, the Daitya leader, who was very powerful, uh, Karajair. Kara means hand. Actually, Kara means doing. So because the hand does everything, the word doer also means hand. Kara, like Tava, Kara, Kamala. So, and then Ja is born. So what is born of the hand is the nails. The nails are born on the hand. So Karaja is, in Sanskrit, a way of saying the nails. So Karajair, with his nails, he uh, ripped apart, not a, not a singha, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, ripped apart the Daityendram. Not a singha, ripped apart the Daitya leader on his lap. He ripped him apart, and an example is given him, Eda Kang Katakrijata, just as a Katakrit. Kata in Sanskrit can mean a straw mat or any kind of screen or anything made of straw. And Eiraka, in this case, would be, you could say like one blade of straw or one. So if you've ever seen people making mats, they you, that you take, a, let's say, a wide piece of straw and then you sort of rip it and then you rip it down like that. And so that's the example that's given here. Just like a straw mat maker literally just rips apart pieces of straw. So that is how... Lord Nasingadev ripped apart Hiranyakashipu. So, uh, yeah, tough love there for Hiranyakashipu. Eda Kang Kata Krijata. So, Nasinga, of course, you could say is the guardian avatar. Krishna has, in, in many avatars, Krishna protects the world, but specifically Nasinga. Uh, saves a helpless devotee who's being uh, persecuted, who's being actually uh, threatened with death by a demon. As we know, Hiranyakashipu, his father, that didn't mean much, uh, tried to kill his son. He tried in every possible way to kill his son. And so uh, that's why Narasinga is so special for us. For example, in our uh, daily services of chanting, Mangalarti, or or any any real 
or, or other artiks or kirtans. At the end, we chant the prayer to Lord Nrsinghadev, actually two prayers, Namaste, Nrsinghadev, etc., and then Tavakara Kamala from Jaidev Goswami's song. So Nrsingha, because he specifically protected an individual devotee, I mean, it wasn't just a question of protecting the world by killing demon armies or, in this case, uh, Lord Narasimha, what's very poignant and powerful about this avatar is that he came to earth in a special avatar just to save one devotee. Of course, this one, and there, there's really no other avatar I can think of that comes to just to save one devotee and a child. So that's Narasimha, and to save that child, that devotee, not from just a general danger like uh, I don't know, you know, just some, he accidentally took some poison or he was in a chariot wreck or something. I mean, it wasn't just saving him from any general danger, but specifically a demon was trying to kill him. His own father was trying to kill him. And Lord Nasinghi came. And so this avatar powerfully shows how Krishna will appear in this world to save an individual devotee who's in danger. So this avatar is very important. Is Lord, uh, Lord Nursing is like the guardian avatar and uh, devotees pray to him daily, of course, and in general for protection. So that's the very special feature of Lord Nursing David. As we know, he then uh, offered a boon to Prahlad who didn't want anything personally, but then said, well, save my father. And of course, even Hiranyakashipu, gold cushion, he was saved. So it's a, uh, it's a very special avatar for the devotees. The next one, Pancha Dasham, the 15th. Vamana Kam, Kritwa, literally means uh, having, having manifested or having made the avatar of Vamana. The Lord, a god, went Adwaram Bale to Bali's arena, sacrificial arena. Pancha Dasham Vamana Kam Krita Gada Dharam Bali. And here is sort of a play on words. Pada Triam Yachamanaha, begging for three steps of land. He took back Pratyaditsu. Aditsu means actually he wanted to take back. That, that was his intention. This is a form of the verb called the causative. So Ad. Aditsu means he wanted to take, or he intended to take. And Prati Aditsu means he wanted to take back. Prati means back. He wanted to take back. Tri Pishtapam, the three worlds, which is a way of saying, Tri Pishtapam is, a, is sort of a poetic Sanskrit term meaning heaven, the heavenly world. And it means also the heavenly worlds that govern all the, the three worlds. So he, Begged, he was begging for three steps, but actually he wanted to take back the three worlds. So uh, that's Vamana, a very attractive, beautiful avatar of Krishna. He's a young uh, brahmachari, a young brahmachari. And as we know, this story is also often cited by the acharyas in their teaching because. Uh, because Bali refused the order of a, well, this kind of word generally is bogus, but of a guru giving bad instructions. So despite all the emphasis in our culture of following authority, following the guru, following the temple president, following this person, following that person, uh, we don't follow bad instructions, instructions which go against Krishna consciousness. And an instruction, for example, which puts you in physical danger or uh, will cause other significant harm is not really an instruction you should follow. So, you know, usually we talk about this, um, usually we talk about this pastime as an example that don't accept instruction from a, uh, a guru who is telling you not to worship Krishna or not to obey Krishna. And in general, uh, it is the duty of an authority, whether it's a guru or father or mother, 
or anyone in a position of authority uh, not to give bad instructions. And not, of course, you know, one can, it also doesn't mean that any instruction you don't like is a bad instruction. So therefore you can basically do whatever you want. That's not the idea. But if some instruction objectively uh, is harmful or harmful to your spiritual life, harmful to your physical or mental health or harmful to the physical or mental or spiritual health of those that you care about, then uh, yeah, we should not do harm. We should not uh, injure people in the name of following an instruction. And we certainly should not reject Krishna's order in the name of following some so-called leader. So the next, uh, verse 20, avatare shodashame, which means in the 16th avatar, avatare shodashame pasyan brahma druho nripan, seeing that the kings uh, were attacking the brahmanas, or threat, uh, then trik septa kritva, which means 21 times, Kupito being enraged, angry, Nikshatram Akaron Mahim. He made literally he made the earth Kshatriya less. Uh, Nik means without, so Kshatriya less. Nikshatram. Uh, he did it twenty-one times because you know he he um this is of course Lord Parashuram, which means uh acts pleasure. Ram, of course, means enjoying, and so one who takes pleasure in his hatchet or chopper or axe, that's the avatar. Uh, so Parashu Rama, he took pleasure in wielding this, <laughs> this axe. Don't want to mess with Parashu Rama. So, again, 16th avatar, avatare, shodha, shame, pasyan, brahma, druho, nirpan, triksepta, kritva, kupito, nikshatran, nikshatran, akaron, nahim. So we know the story how the uh, Kshatriyas rebelled against the Brahmins, but this story is also very important in the Mahabharata, which you may not be aware of. Uh, keep in mind that uh, when the Mahabharata events take place, that Parashuram is still alive on the earth. And of course, we know Karna approached Parashuram for martial instruction and and lied, said that he was a Brahmana when actually he was a Kshatriya. And uh, so what that means is historically that Parashuram appeared and wiped out the royal order uh, just a sh not too long, not too much time before the Mahabharata events take place. Because again, he's still alive. And so... Uh, So therefore, um, this is what happened because the Mahabharata, here's the connection between Lord Parashuram and the Mahabharata. Uh, when, when Parashuram uh, destroyed all the kings, there was a problem on the earth, namely, there were no Kshatriyas, there were no kings. Uh, so, this is similar to Vena. When there's no kings, there's no rulers. It's chaos, and specifically, the um, specifically the uh, wives, the kshatriyas, not the wives, but but the but the eligible, marriageable women, the kshatriyas. There were no kings to marry, and so it was a real problem. No rulers, chaos. You know, thousands of kshatriya, which is the feminine word thousands of these women with no one to marry and it was a mess. So sometimes evil rulers are killed, but as we see in history, often it leads to all kinds of problems. Uh, just like I just thinking of Nicaragua where they killed that, uh, that dictator Somoza, who had sort of a Vedic name, right, Somoza. And then the revolt of Los Sandinistas led by Daniel Ortega. So the leader of the revolution became, of course, the next dictator. 
And so there's a very old story that today's revolutionary is tomorrow's tyrant. Very old story. And so, um, so what happened is they made the, the, the wise people, the leaders of society decided that the Kshatriyas, the, the Kshatriya women, would approach the most pure Brahmins who would then give them sons. So they approached the most, you know, the purest sages and they had sons. And so the royal order was reconstituted. One benefit of this was you had kings all over the earth who were the sons of great sages. And of course they were very pure be, being the sons of great sages. And uh, it, the Mahabharata says emphatically that it was as if the Satya Yuga had returned, even though this is really toward the end of Dwapara Yuga, because it's not too, it, it, it's not too long before uh, the appearance of Krishna. And so it's toward the end of Dwapara Yuga, and yet it was like Satya Yuga. And basically no one lied, no one was stealing anything, there was no uh, violence. And so you have a situation where kings, like let's say the Kuru monarch at that time, and the Kurus are supposed to be the leading dynasty. He's sitting on the bank of the Ganges practicing yoga, some form of spiritual yoga for the welfare of the world. Why? Because there's nothing to do. There are no bad guys, there's no criminals, and people just do the right thing, so you don't need to govern people. So here you have the leading king in the world just meditating on the bank of the Ganges. And what's interesting is that it's at this time, actually, it's at this time in history, of course, uh, I should mention Pratipa's son is Shantanu, who is the, uh, who is the father, of course, of Chitrangan and Vichitravirian, the grandfather of, the, of Pandu, and the great-grandfather of great grand, uh, grandfather of the Pandava. So uh, the Asuras, as I've explained many times, if you read the eighth canto of the Bhagavatam, there's a great war between the Asuras and the Asuras, demigods and demons. And so many of the demigods, uh, uh, many of the demons who are defeated decide they will take over a sort of a small insignificant planet and start a, an insurgency, start to fight back, take over the universe. The planet they choose is the earth. So when the Krishna book begins once when the world, earth was overburdened by the unnecessary military forces of, of Asuras disguised as kings, uh, Asuras disguised as kings means they actually weren't human beings. They were actually Asuras from higher planets. So the world was invaded. The reason I mention this is one of the reasons the Asuras picked the earth, it was because it was an easy target. Everyone was unsuspecting. The great kings of the earth were just you know, sitting on the banks of rivers, uh, meditating and doing spiritual yoga because there was nothing else to do. So here you have a planet which is completely unsuspecting in which, you know, sort of everyone is, you could say, out of shape in terms of military activities. And uh, it's like such a yoga again. So easy pickings, you know, they thought, yeah, why not the earth? It's out of the way and no one's going to pay attention. And the Asuras actually have an interesting strategy because the Asuras know that Dharma is a force in the universe. Like, if, actually, that's where uh, George Lucas got the idea of the force. You know, the force is with you. May the force be with you. He got that, of course, from, uh, from Eastern Japanese uh, martial arts philosophy, which came from which came from Vedic culture, like the word, you've heard of jujitsu, which is a martial art, of course, jujutsu in Sanskrit means a warrior. And so uh, Buddhism also came from India. So a lot of culture came from India to China and Japan. And this idea that there's a force in the universe and uh, that actually in the Mahabharata describes that force and it's called Dharma. So dharma is not merely a rule, like, you know, thou shalt not kill. It's not merely a rule. It's actually a power in the universe. And so the Mahabharata says things like uh, dharma rakshito rakshiti. When dharma is protected, it protects. Or dharma hing, uh, 
hingsati, uh, uh, hingsito hingsati, that when dharma is injured, it injures in return. So dharma is not merely a rule in some book, it's actually the force in the universe. So if you take karma that, uh, you know, you get a reaction for what you do, an, an equal reaction, then what is the measurement? Like who, what is the standard for measuring what's a good act, what's a bad act? That's dharma. And so to say that you get, like there's a law of karma that imposes upon you the reactions of your activities, that law is actually dharma. It's actually dharma, which is reacting to what you do. So the good deeds are rewarded, bad deeds are punished. So that's a, the relationship between dharma and karma, in case you're interested. And um, so the asuras know this. The asuras know this, but they, they have this interesting idea. Y you could say it because we know they're intelligent. Even Hiranyakashipu in the Bhagavatam, he, um, you know, sometimes he preaches like a real nice Vedic philosophy. So, but what the asuras think is that even though Dharma is a law of the universe, it's a law that can be manipulated. So that when you perform good deeds, for example, all the demons have their brahmanas and they perform sacrifices, they pile up punya points, they pile up, uh, you know, good karma, and then you can spend it. What we know is that if you do a good thing and a bad thing, you get the reactions of both. But somehow the asuras seem to be calculating that, uh, you know, you can get like a bad karma offset. You know, you can, you can do good deeds, you can perform dharma, and that will counteract a dharma. You have a dharma bank account, you can spend from it by sometimes like killing innocent people or whatever. And so, but anyway, to minimize their adharma, they have this ingenious plan to take over the earth, which is to take birth as sons in the most important royal dynasties and to take over the earth politically simply by taking birth in the right families and inheriting kingdoms. And so, for example, without going into all the details, I'm, I'm working on the Mahavarata now, um, one of the most powerful demons, uh, Viprachiti, who's the first, he's Danu Pratamaja, which means he's the firstborn of Danu. In other words, he's the first Danava. So he's a very important cosmic Asura, Danava, and he takes birth as the son of Brihadrath takes birth in Magadha and takes over one of the most powerful dynasties in the world. It's even the dynasty that was supposed to protect the earth from the Asuras. That's very clever. Here this dynasty is supposed to protect the earth from the Asura invasion. And so the Asuras take birth in that family and take it over. Or for example, uh, Duryodhana took birth in the Kuru dynasty. And the Yadu dynasty was taken over by Kangsa. So you see all these, you see all these asuras taking birth in royal families, and they're doing that because the earth is unsuspecting and sort of yeah, just not paying attention because it's like such a yuga. Because Parashuram killed all the kings, and the, and the Kshatriya ladies, the young ladies, uh, had children with great sages, and so this is the earth that the Asuras come to and are taking over, and that's why Bhumi has to go to Brahma and say, I have a serious problem, because there's an invasion, and she can't deal with these powerful extraterrestrial Asuras. And that's when Krishna decides, I will come personally, and uh, I'll take care of it. So that is the... Uh, so all that's related to Parshuram. The next avatar, it's the last one I'll do today, if I can get this in, Tatak, then, thereafter, Saptadashe, in the 17th, Jata, he took birth, Satyavatyang uh, Parasharat, again, the, the way it's always said in Sanskrit, in Satyavati from Parashara. That's, of course, Vyastev. Chakre Veda Tarok Shaka, he made branches for the Vedic for the Veda tree, the Veda Taro, the Veda tree, he created branches. Drishtva, having seen Pungsalpa Medasaha, having seen that people were now of little intelligence, people were becoming just very unintelligent, 
and they can't understand the Vedas, so we need sort of like uh, the Veda for dummies, basically is what it's saying here. Because Alpa Medas uh, basically means dummies. So you know all those books like this and this or that for dummies, so this is the Veda for dummies. That's really what he does. Drishtra Pungsalpa Medasa. So that's the 17th. And I think actually I'm going to speak about that uh, next week because there's a lot to say about Vyasa. And one thing you may notice is that starting with the 16th avatar, which is, of course, Parashuram, uh, and now we have Vyasa. Uh, we're getting into the modern period, so to speak. Because uh, Parshuram is still alive when Vyasa is born. And, and of course, that's the uh, 17th, and then the 18th is going to be, uh, well, then we, we, we go back again to Lord Rama. But then we come back to, uh, we're gonna come back to Krishna Balaram. So basically, at this point in the list, we're starting to get all the avatars from a certain class of literature called Itihasa, which means the histories. And because in the two great Itihasa literatures, the two great histories are, of course, Ramayana and Mahabharata. And so at this point in the list of avatars, we're starting to get the Itihasa avatars, the historical avatars in that sense. Of course, the Puranas also tell a lot of history and all the other avatars are mentioned in the Puranas including the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, but with Parashuram and Vyasa, uh, we have two contemporary, uh, con uh, contemporaneous avatars, two avatars who are alive at the same time on the earth. And then we're going to get Krishna and Balaram. So we're starting to get into, you could say, end of Dwapara Yuga avatars. And uh, this is all, of course, Mahabharata material. So, Thank you all for listening. Uh, hope you got your money's worth since you did have to probably pay a little electricity to listen or battery life. So uh, let me just see real quickly if anyone has any questions here. Um, here's a question. Por favor, podría aclararme si carme es un instrumento de dharma entonces. Please, could you clarify? For me, if karma is an instrument of dharma. Uh, as I, well, what I was explaining is that um, karma is simply a system by which whatever you do produces a reaction, but there has to be some way of calculating what the proper reaction is. There has to be some way of measuring how good or how bad you did. Well, what you did is, and the measurement is by dharma. I mean, the extent to which the extent to which your activity is dharma, it's good. The extent to which it's a dharma, it's bad. So dharma is just the measuring rod, so to speak. Another question, may we know your insights regarding the quote of Chaitanya Charitamrita that says, if one eats food cooked by materialistic people, the mind becomes evil. Uh, Prabhupada sometimes had to cook things. I mean, there's a famous story where Prabhupada in the early days when he went back to India in 1970 and he had all his disciples with him and they were on a train and Prabhupada told them to go to the restaurant car of the train, just, you know, have some rice and dal or chapatis or something. And uh, so in general, we avoid that. And uh, we have to understand also that, that what the world was like. I'm not saying everyone should run out and just eat anything, but during, the, during Lord Chaitanya's time, um, there was a very steep hierarchy. I mean, the way foods were prepared, there were a lot of low-class people, as there are today, of course. Nowadays, most uh, processed foods are, are made by machines, which are actually, according to health food standards, I mean, health standards usually kept very clean. And so I'm not saying, therefore, eat whatever you want, but... Um, in those days, uh, cooks, I mean, even today in India, cook is not like a high class profession. And they usually go to like Western restaurants. Even some of these, so it's like even like vegan restaurants, you go look at the kitchen, there's some pretty basic people in there. And so, yeah, 
I mean, we should be careful about our food. So another comment um, from Ramcharita. I have a general question about the Srimad Bhagavatam and Mahabharata, which I hope is appropriate for this forum, more specifically about the proper way to understand the extraordinary events described in them on a thread on mythology, which took place more than a decade ago on our academic conference. Past. You used an onion analogy to explain the, ex the extraordinariness of these events. If I recall well, glad you remember it because I don't remember it. You said the reality is like an onion with several layers corresponding to different ways human beings perceive it, which depend on their level of spiritual consciousness. Ordinary events are located on the low levels, which are perceived through our ordinary consciousness. Srimad Bhagavatam, the extraordinary events of Srimad Bhagavatam and Mahabharata would be located on higher levels, accessible only through higher consciousness. This would explain why nowadays people in general do not experience events of the same kind. Could you elaborate on this? No, yes, I think that you remember it well. Um, yes. First of all, I, I should disclose here right, that... Uh, that there's two there's two sources for my conviction that that's the way the universe really is well actually three sources one source is just the bog the shastras themselves that say that these things took place the second thing is that Siddhaputta, uh who was i think the most brilliant scientist that ever joined the Hare krishna movement uh he gave a very good example that um if you go, if you have an address, like I always give the simple example, you're going to a particular address, like 10 Main Street, and you go to the address, and there's a building, you walk in the building, and you don't find the office you're looking for, but it's actually a 10-story building. And so all 10 stories, days and days, all 10 stories are 10 Main Street. They're all the same address, but there's many, many stories. And so if you just walk into the lobby, if you walk into the bottom floor and you don't know there are other stories, you won't understand. So that was Siddhaputta's example that the universe is, is multidimensional. The third reason I accept that uh, is that I have personal experience of it, I have to admit. I don't usually talk about my mystic experiences. I'm more known as sort of like a dry logician, but uh, I do have personal experience of that, which uh, I can only reasonably explain by saying the universe is multidimensional. So, so yes, that is the example. And it's, you know, so when the, for example, when the astronauts went to the moon, they're just in the lobby, they're on the ground floor. They don't know it's, a, it, there's actually many stories and many dimensions which are perceived in different states of consciousness. So here's another question. Por que os devotos de actualidade não conseguem distinguir quem são os demônios da actualidade? Thank you. Okay, why uh, do devotees today, why are they unable to distinguish who are the, I guess it means demons, the demonios, the demons at the present time, and they have different points of view about the real problems of the modern age? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it's very hard to figure this out. Why do people disagree? Because people love to disagree and everyone has their opinion and, and everyone uh, has internet access. But, but actually, um, I mean, if you read chapter 16 of the Bhagavad Gita, it's better if people say post in English, um, if you read chapter 16 of the Gita, Krishna gives the symptoms of demons. So if the symptoms apply, then so I think it's just it's a very simple process of just reading the characteristics. Krishna explains who asuras are, and then people that act in that way. It doesn't mean they're like, you know, like these cosmic demons, but the extent to which anyone behaves in that way or shows that kind of character, to that extent, they're infected by those sort of qualities. And uh, Prabhupada once said, you can measure your own advancement by seeing to what extent you are free from the demonic qualities. So 
For example, when we envy, when we become victims of envy, that is a demonic quality. It doesn't mean that we're demons, but it does mean that we are still infected by that quality. We're becoming too angry or wanting to hurt other people. And you, uh, so just, you know, read it. Krishna explains very clearly in chapter 16 of the Gita and just use your common sense and see where those definitions apply. What is your opinion on being more attracted to the pastimes of particular avatars of Krishna than to Krishna Lila? Well, the brother of Rupa and Sanatana Goswami, uh, Anupama, uh, he was attracted to Ramchandra. So, as we know, Krishna is the source of all avatars, and uh, we chant Hare Krishna and Hare Rama. So, you know, to each his own. Everyone has their own life and everyone makes their own decisions. Personally, it's just me. I, you know, I really love Krishna. And I, uh, yeah, Krishna's my favorite personality of Godhead. So um, everyone has their own life. But we know that the origin of all avatars is Krishna. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for listening. And... I hope we'll see you again next Sunday.